Whenever Chaim Gori, Zichrono Levacha, the Israeli poet and journalist, was asked, Ma Shlomcha, how are you? He would reply, Shlomi Keshalom Ami. I fare as well as my people. I feel that way these days. While my little universe, my family, may be doing just fine for the moment, there is something in my existence that is indescribably bound up with this people of ours. Gori's answer has never resonated with such intensity as it has this past year, since October 7th. How are our people doing? We are not whole. We are broken. 101 hostages remain in Gaza. 1,200 souls were brutally murdered on October 7th. Hundreds of soldiers have died in Gaza and now in Lebanon. Our people are incomplete. And we are traumatized as if we weren't traumatized enough already. We are at war, we are afraid, and we are often a nation that stands alone. There is so much hatred towards Israel and in turn towards Jews in our own country and around the world. Although we have a land, a state, we are not feeling much at home. There is no peace, not between our neighbors, not within our people. There are generational divides in our community, and there is community strife over Israel. Some feel the Jewish people's undying loyalty to Israel comes at the expense of a critical eye about the occupation and compassion for Palestinians and the destruction that has been wrought in Gaza, and that it comes also at the expense of a sense of justice and morality. The unprecedented association of Jews with Israel carries both the sense of profound heartbreak since October 7th and also prior, the year prior, with the initiation of the judicial reform. And at the same time as Jews with all our heartbreak, many of us feel that we're on the defensive constantly. Even the Jews, like me, I would count myself amongst them who have been deeply critical of the Israeli government for years, are seen as representing Israel, all of Israel, including the current extremist Israeli government. We are not okay. So much has collapsed. Itai Lev, an Israeli musician, writer, and choir director, writes of such a collapse in his poem, Mom is All Right. And I'm going to invite you to turn to the booklet on page two. Page two. Ima amra she'ad egdal kvar lo yiyet tzava, ima tzadka. Od lo gadalti ukvar lo haya tzava. Hu lo haya kesheshamati tzakot bachutz. Hu lo haya kesheraiti et aba kokach mefuchad velachutz. Hu lo haya keshedelet habayit nifritza veviata. Hulo haya keshahit habeti mitahat lamita. Hulo haya keshahadafnu shloshtenu et deletama amad. Hulo haya keshahazman pashut amad. Hulo haya keshem nichnesu pit om penima. Hulo haya keshem keshem karu et aba meima. 
Imra ama she'ad she'egdal kvar lo ye tzava, ima tzadka. Ve'akshav, rak ratziti lagidla, she'hi tamid sodeket, bachiti tzaakti, ve'hi adayin shoteket. Mom said that when I grew up there would be no army. Mom was right. I haven't yet grown, and already there was no army. It wasn't there when I heard the screaming outside. It wasn't there when I saw Dad so scared and stressed. It wasn't there when the door was kicked in. It wasn't there when I hid under the bed. It wasn't there when we three pushed back on the door of the safe room. It wasn't there when time just stood still. It wasn't there when they suddenly entered. It wasn't there when they tore dad off mom. Mom had said that when I grew up, there would be no army. Mom was right. Now all I want is to tell her that she is always right. I cried, I screamed, and still she is silent. It's a devastating poem. The images that it evokes of October 7th, the details of a child hiding under a bed, the terrorists breaking into the safe room, a husband and wife ripped apart from each other are all unimaginable, yet we know they happened. Then, of course, the poem's greatest irony is that the promise of the mother became realized in all the most distorted ways on October 7th. The army never did arrive. And when a child, after witnessing all that horror, wants to tell their mother how right she was, this child can't. Because their mother is either kidnapped or dead. The poem leaves us breathless. I've read the poem countless times, and every time it kind of takes my breath away. Recognizing that the foundations of the belief of the poet, of the child, have all fallen apart for their family, and the truth is for all of us. So many certainties and assumptions collapsed this year. Of course, a basic sense of safety collapsed. In Israel, the army was too late if it arrived at all. The intelligence failed, or they failed to listen to the intelligence, or to listen to the women who had the intelligence. The place that was supposed to be the greatest haven for the Jewish people after the Shoah, after the Holocaust, was completely caught off guard and vulnerable. And the assumption that the conflict, as they call it, with the Palestinians could be managed was debunked. Even in America, for all our comfort here as Jews and the acceptance and success we have achieved individually and collectively, we feel a little less at home. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. Jew Jewish students, many of them, don't feel safe on campus. Hostage posters are ripped down in our neighborhood. A former president has stated that if he loses the election, that Jews will be responsible. I now have a child in public high school, and I actually think about what he's going to encounter as a Jew in high school, which I didn't have to worry about when he was in Jewish day school. Our belief that the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice has also collapsed. The possibility of peace between Israelis and Palestinians feels farther away than ever. There is so much hatred being spewed 
from leaders around the globe. Hatred of the immigrants. Some spew hatred of Palestinians, particularly in the Israeli government. Many people spew hatred of Jews and Israelis. Much hatred is spoken about those who are not like us. There has been a regression of civil rights in our own country, a woman's right to make decisions about her own body, and every citizen's right to vote, no matter the color of their skin, have been compromised. Free and fair elections are no longer guaranteed. Many of us are worried for what will happen this November. The promise of liberal democracy, which once seemed as the guiding light in the world, even with its imperfections, is fragile at best. Truth itself has even collapsed. False news and information are now equally valid as truth in the public square. Leaders don't feel compelled to honor, let alone tell the truth. Lies run rampant on social media and in our political discourse. And denials of the truth of what happened on October 7th or the devastation that has been wrought on innocent Palestinians due to the war are dismissed often. The enormity of it is overwhelming. Our sense of dislocation is profound. This state of existence has a name in the Jewish tradition. We call it exile. Galut. From the very first human beings, expulsion from Gan Eden to Cain, being cursed to endlessly wander the earth, to Yosef going down to Mitzrayim, to our entire people's enslavement in Mitzrayim for hundreds of years, to the 2,000-year exile from the land of Israel post-destruction, to the ongoing spiritual exile from God and our essence. Exile, galut, is centered around distance, displacement, and brokenness. Kabbalah even understands exile as the actual fundamental condition <clears throat> of the universe and God. Lorianic Kabbalah tells the famous story that before the world was created, God put forth God's light into those vessels, but the vessels couldn't contain the light, and so they shattered, and the light was scattered all throughout the world, looking to return to its source. Nothing is whole or at home. Exile is a state of longing to return. But the problem is we can't return to what was. We can't return to October 6th and Erev Shmini Atzeret, although I would love to, to rewind the clock. There is no going back. We can't reverse course, yet it is difficult to know how to build again, what to long for when so much has been shattered. Chaim Gori's famous line, Shlomi Keshalom Ami, actually comes from his poem, All Will Be Well, Yihiyetov. And the poem speaks to this kind of moment. Just a note about Chaim Gori who lived from 1923 to 1918. He died at 94. He was born in British Mandate Palestine in a socialist Zionist family, and he joined the Palmach as a young man and fought in the War of Independence to establish the State of Israel. He was a celebrated and often critical voice of Israel's founding generation and its conscience. He also wrote of the wrenching inner dilemmas complexities and contradictions of the Zionist enterprise that tormented him. Mr. Gori was also a journalist. He actually covered the Eichmann trials in 1961. And he was a documentary filmmaker. Let's look at his poem, All Will Be Well, I Promise. 
Yetovani Maftiach, Bolkitsat Sheket, Bolkitsat Shiamum, Magia Lacha, Hako Kochach, So Ekpo, Logamor, Mashlom Cha, Shoalimo Tiberachov, Anashim the Minyehem, Shlomi Keshalom Ami, Ani Meshim Lahem, the Az Potim Hem Anacha Kitsara, Keshutafim the Itsara. Ye tov ani maftiach, ke ish sodo shel mashiach. Come, a bit of quiet. Come, a little boredom. You deserve it. Everything is so loud here, unfinished. How are you? They ask me on the street. All kinds of people. I am how my people are, I respond. And then they heave a small sigh, like sharers of a troubled time. All will be well, I promise, as if I were the secret keeper of the Messiah. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be so nice to have a little bit of peace and quiet, a reprieve from the loudness and the heaviness of what it means to live as a Jewish people with a Jewish state that is still searching for what it needs to be? The poet recognizes the tiredness of living amongst such turmoil. Even the Hebrew is loaded. A simple question in Hebrew, like mashlom cha, literally means, how is your peace? Or how is your wholeness? The answer, shlomi keshalom ami, I am as my people are, implies that the poet and his people are not so whole and have no peace. The people are looking to the poet for assurances that their present state will not last forever. They want the poet to be a prophet, to calm their nerves and offer some comfort. So the poet obliges them and tells them, yeah, tov, it'll be okay. A colloquial Hebrew phrase that attempts to dispel any concerns if you, in Israel, if you walk around, people are like, yeah, tov. Like, it's like a very kind of throwaway statement. He tries to dispel any concerns and tries to provide the guarantee that they are looking for. But the poet knows that the poet is no prophet, that the poet cannot see, cannot foresee what will be. He may offer words of assurance, but he has no access to divine truth. Like the poet, you may be surprised, I too have no access to divine secrets. And though David Broza has been singing his anthem for peace, Yihye Tov, for decades upon decades, the song, It Will Be Okay, it has yet to be okay. We do need a bit of quiet to hold all we think and feel personally and communally. Robert Frost wrote, a poem begins as a lump in the throat, a sense of wrong, a homesickness, a love sickness. I don't know anyone who hasn't arrived at this new year without a lump in their throat for all that we have experienced, a sense of wrong in how devastating our world is, a homesickness for a more secure, safe, and peaceful existence, and a lovesickness for that simple feeling of wanting something that fulfills our heart's desires. William Carlos Williams, in his poem, That Green Flower, wrote, it is difficult to get the news from poems. Yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. I'll say it again. It is difficult to get the news from poems. Yet men die miserably every day 
for lack of what is found there. For all the news that we have watched, read, and listened in 5784, it is not the measure of a life to know what is happening in the world and to read the news. All the news that is fit to print will always leave us empty. We will spend these awesome days in community, in prayer and song, silence and tears, because I think we want more. We need more. We may not have access to all of the divine truth, and we are not prophets, though we are the children of the children of the children of the children of prophets, but I believe we want poetry in our lives. A poem can explore the deepest emotions and thoughts that often remain hidden to us. It can help us cry and sigh and release what we are holding and give us the chance to face what we are feeling. A poem can help us transcend surface level understandings to reach profound insights. A poem can uncover a bit of the mystery of living to confront difficult truths and help us push through them. A poem may describe what is, but it also can invite us to wonder and imagine what could be. A poem unleashes new questions and in its ambiguity awakens a desire to understand. A poem is a prayer and most prayers are poems. So these Yamim Noraim, we will be guided by poetry, mostly Israeli poems, some poems post October 7th, with the hope that they will guide us on our search in the darkness of exile. Exile in our tradition is not meant to leave us content with the status quo. It is endowed with profound religious meaning. The Talmud teaches every place to which Israel was exiled, the Shekhinah, the indwelling presence of God went with them. God is to be found in exile and in the darkness, even our sense of homelessness, even with our distance. As the psalmist writes, Karov Adonai Lenishvere Lev, God is close to the brokenhearted. Part of being in exile is to honor the brokenness, to give it expression and voice. We hope something can emerge from there. But we are not only supposed to feel the intensity of all that is shattered. We are supposed to ask hard questions about how we got here. Our tradition over and over again saw tshuva, repentance as a response, as the healing to exile. Our distance was not only a matter of circumstance, but a demand to do an accounting of the soul, a cheshbon nefesh. What role and responsibility do we have for the predicament we find ourselves in? How have we gone astray? What do I need to change? Tshuva is the work of coming home, literally to return, coming home to ourselves, coming home to community and to God. This state of exile is also a chance to evaluate our moral code. What are the values and beliefs that we hold most dear? If we need to rebuild from the brokenness, what essential building blocks are at the foundation of our personal and communal lives? What, what must we hold on to? What is non-negotiable? How can we commit again to living by a moral compass? If anything, the state of exile in our tradition has taught us to learn from our ancestors all the ways they were resilient and not only endured in the darkness, but were incredibly creative and imaginative. While these times may feel unprecedented, throughout the course of history, our people have traversed so much and through it, the memories of those that came before us can serve as a guide, as inspiration, and as an anchor. Finally, one of the greatest teachings of our ancestors is to build faith in the darkness. Faith, says Reb Zaman, is not a noun. 
It is not something we acquire. He says it's not something you can buy at the grocery store. It is a verb, ultimately. We face through the hard stuff. For all the divine sparks that have been scattered throughout the world, and even within us, faith is choosing to find them and lift them up. Faith is believing that even if the Mashiach is not around the corner, there are daily acts of redemption to choose, even in the uncertainty, even through the pain. It is traditional to conclude the service of Ne'ilah at the end of Yom Kippur with the words, L'shanah haba'a b'Yerushalayim, also on Pesach, next year in Yerushalayim. These words are meant to awaken both the constancy of exile and the deep desire to return home to a place of wholeness and peace. These words speak to a promise that has yet to be fulfilled and demand to work for its arrival. These words pray for a shorter distance between the heavenly and the earthly Jerusalem. May we have strength, faith, humility, and courage to search to find our way home. May we look for the poetry and raise up the sparks. And when we are asked the question, Ma shlomcha, ma shlomech, ma shlomchem, how are you? May we merit the answer, shlomi kishalom ami. I am as whole as my people are, without a sigh, but with the hope of shalom, of peace, of wholeness for you, for me, for our people, and for all the peoples everywhere. Kenyi Hiratzon, so may it be.